Now, it's interesting, when I first started bringing plein air painting to classes, it was in 1980, when we first went there, and Judy is, was part of those classes, we'd go to Yosemite, and we were like the only people plein air painting. Do you know anyone else that was doing that? No, the buses would come by and people would want to buy them right off the roadside. Yeah, they were like, what are you guys doing there? We're painting. It's like, huh? And we didn't even know the term plein air painting. <laughs> You know, I grew up in like Tahoe, so it, you know it was common for us to go out and paint. So we called it outdoor painting. Um, yeah, well, outdoor plein air, whatever they call it. But the thing is, um, it, it didn't become a movement until just recently. I mean, you know, it's what you the know. fifth year of the plein air convention. I would say that plein air basically has just caught on the last five years. So it's a new thing. Prior to that. It was a little here, a little there, and then when we were doing it, nobody was even oil painting back then. Everybody was doing watercolor and pastel, and it was the world of abstract art. And in that world, I don't know, we won't even go down that road, but um, painting from real or painting from life is, is, um, wasn't a possibility. And I was telling you, just starting a story about this guy who, who called yesterday, and he wanted, and I said, go out there and paint outdoors. You know, do a plein air painting, call me Saturday morning, we'll do some coaching. And he says, okay. He's never done it before. I said, well, let me see what you can do in two and a half hours. How long do you guys go paint? About two hours. Well, two hours. Yeah, two hours. That's about what a plein air painting. <coughs> so I said, well, go out there. And then I said, go home and I want you to paint a glass still life. And he goes, why do you want me to paint a still life? And I said, because first I want to see if you can paint. <laughs> I don't know. I've seen... His paintings, you know, when I'm coaching people, they're not like in, I've never, seen, they just call up, I want to coach. They could be in South Africa somewhere, you know, so I don't know what they've been exposed to. So they show me pictures. I don't know if they painted them on their own, if they're in adult ed and somebody else is painting them. Well, if they're in adult education, yeah, like, you know, classes. So they send me really great pictures. So, so he says, but why, why is still life? And I go, because the whole idea behind plein air painting or painting from nature is that you're painting from a model. You're painting three-dimensional objects, rendering them on a two-dimensional surface. It's no different to paint a glass of water than it is to paint a airstream sitting out in a park. It's no different painting a glass of water than to paint a rock or a tree. It's there in front of you. You've got to take something that's three-dimensional out there and put it on a two-dimensional surface. And make it look three-dimensional, three okay? Yeah. So a lot of planar painters sharpen their viewing skills. And I can tell you, before the planar convention, any artist that is planning on going there that's worth anything will probably do six or seven indoor still lives, especially if they live someplace where the weather's bad. Mm -hmm. And they're doing it to sharpen their skill. Some artists call it toning their eyes, toning their vision. And so what you guys are doing, I know I'm giving you still lifes. Because I can't give you anything else right now because uh, you know I could say go out and paint, but a lot of you, that's even more cumbersome than doing the homework assignments. I know you can, can control this environment. But I'm not doing this because the world needs more teacups on canvases. I'm doing this because I'm toning your skills. What you learn doing this from three-dimensional, you can use it on landscape painting. You could do it on portraits. It's very hard to sit in front of a model and paint it. But that's plein air painting too. Mm -hmm. And when you go outdoors, all of a sudden you have buildings and you have cars and you have rocks and shapes and forms. All that is objects, just like a glass of water. And I said, I want to see how you put together a composition. All you have is a table and a glass of water. Show me how you can put together a composition. If you can put together a composition well that way, then to turn it into a rock and trees is very simple. But, you know, we talked about eye magnets and composition and lighting and shadowing and central focal point. If they don't know how to handle that in a closed environment like a still life, how in the world are they going to do it when they're outdoors? So all of these things that we're doing in here is teaching you to be a planar painter. And it shows these gals, the sisters, um, they're out there painting. Look at these. This is as good as anything that you would see 
in, in the convention. A lot of artists would just give their eye teeth to be able to paint that loose and that. Okay. Yeah. Very, very nice. Look at that. Anybody know who's did this? It's Rada. Our tight little portrait painter that's painting. Look at the wonderful brush strokes. And I told her, I said, do you know how many people come to me at the plain art convention and they go, I want to loosen up. How do you get that loose feeling? No, well, it's practice, but it's also a certain kind of confidence. Mm -hmm. You have to have a certain kind of confidence. You have to almost be willing to fail and be surprised that you could pull yourself out. If you're totally in control of your situation, you will never open up a new possibility. You're stuck. You get in a rut, and it's hard to get out of a rut. So you almost have to amuse yourself. Paint it differently. Paint, go at it a different way. Even with the homework assignments, it's like, don't paint it like you do in class. And don't try to paint it good. In fact, I would rather have you paint it really, really bad. Because you probably will learn something. And I know a lot of you are painting right now in a, in a really comfortable zone. But that's how you would probably paint if I wasn't around. But there's so much out there. That's the great thing about doing talks like this, is that you get an opportunity to see <laughs> something new, a different way, a possibility of some kind. OK, so, so the thing is what I love about your work is that you tend to have a way of trying to take our subject matter and bring more into it. And yet sometimes just it by itself can be extraordinary. You know, a lot of times what I find that people mask themselves in other conversations and other ways to cover things where they feel uncomfortable with. And so what I would like to see when I give a homework assignment out, and we talked about this a little bit with Marilyn last week, is that you don't need to come in and invent something. We love it when you do because you show us what artists do. And so it's awesome to see that moment where there's that excitement where you get to see something being created. But the reason why I have people paint just a glass of water is I want to see how they paint. And if you paint it just absolutely something exquisite. You know, some of the water bottles that were done last week, they were exquisite. And I said, imagine them gigantic. And it's just a blown up water bottle, but you're looking at something and you're rendering it. That's the practice. The story part of it is the artistic part of it, and I like that too. And I like to be able to combine them, which you do, because that gives us an opportunity to see another voice. But I also want to see what you're looking at. Sometimes the, the story overcovers the, you know, the flaws of your painting, whether or not you're actually getting it right. Um, here, where's your central focal point? Exactly. See, when I go, usually you're like, where's your central focal point? I want to have everybody say, well, it's right there. But you hear, so the neck, no, it's like, and I want to hear you jump up and go, it's, you know, own it. Like, okay, so where's your central focal point? Don't look at your well, pain. I'm still processing what you said 30 seconds. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As a homework assignment, I'm still always looking to see whether or not you have a central focal point, whether or not you have eye magnets, whether it's composed well. The reason why I have students work on a glass of water is the placement of something is important. You can glaze it, you can glaze it, you can repaint it, you can do anything. It's just the bones at the beginning. But God, if I didn't ask you to do it, we wouldn't even have this. And so I just admire you for doing it. That's not the case, and you did a great job. Now what? Take it to the next level.